guy who actually got us to think about this, right? The mutant. And he said, really, we live on a water planet here. And if we're going to understand the isotope variation, we've got to understand some basic fundamental rules of what's driving the isotope variation in the hydrologic cycle. And there's four rules. And we're going to come back to these over and over again in the, in the context of this lecture here. The first of these I already kind of emphasized. Is the first is you better expect isotope fractionation when you get a phase change in the water. When you go from liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid, liquid to solid, solid back to vapor, whatever it might be. There's three phases of the water. And every time you change those phases, you're going to get an isotope effect associated with those. All right? When you change those phases, those phases are also going to be influenced very much by the thermal environment that that phase change is actually taking place in. Warm place, pretty easy. Liquid goes to vapor, right? Cold place, liquid might go to vapor or it might go to solid, all right? So we've got a different phase change there. So the thermal environment in which those phase changes are actually taking place will have a very large influence on the magnitude of the isotope effect. And as Turi brought up yesterday, lower temperatures, larger isotope effects, all right? So right there, simple rule. You go to a cold place, you can expect to see more isotope variation in the water sources that you're actually measuring there. All right? You work in a cold place, you got lots more isotope variation than if you work in the tropics. All right? So there's a really cool rule or expectation that we can expect to see over and over again. Now, back to the point that I made a little earlier. We have to pay attention to fractionation, of course, but we really have to pay attention to mixing because there's so many different pools and so many different fluxes by which water moves around on our planet that you're always going to have some fractionation and some mixing that's going to set the isotope values that you guys as researchers are going to want to know about because they are your home base. That's the place you're going to run home to mama and say, OK, where do I start? Well, I have to know what the fractionation effect is and the mixing effect before I can even begin to even ask my question. All right? So you're always going to be thinking about how mixing and fractionation come uh, into play. And in that respect then, and kind of under the hood of that, is that we can also usually always expect to see not only equilibrium effects, but also additional kinetic effects. And those lead to two different kinds of isotope fractionation events. All right? And I'll put that in the context of what we'll call the global meteoric water line here in a few minutes. But always think about equilibrium and kinetic fractionation as having something to do with your waters. All right? They may be small, they may be large, but they'll always be at play. And they're not mutually exclusive. They're often going on. You can't, many times people want to go, oh, I just want to have an equilibrium effect because it's so much easier to model. All right? But many times there's going to be an additional kinetic effect there because we don't live in a saturated world, right? If we lived at 100% relative humidity and our atmosphere was fully saturated all the time, we'd live in an equilibrium world. It'd pretty, be pretty easy, all right? But we don't. Global humidity is 81%. Some places it's 1%, all right? And so as soon as we start to drop atmospheric humidity, we can send water on one, what appears to be one-way trips, which are kinetic fractionation events, all right? So you'll see that kinetic effects can manifest themselves either in large ways or in small ways, depending on where we are within the hydrologic system. OK, let's get to the isotopes. Turi brought this up. With respect to hydrogen and oxygen, there's not many we have to pay attention to. Hydrogen's pretty simple. We have two stable isotopes, protium and deuterium, all right, that we pay attention to. So as again, in this partial uh, chart of the nuclides, we're getting variation in the neutrons and the same number of protons within both our hydrogen or oxygen isotope system. We're going to pay attention to mostly oxygen 16 and oxygen 18 when we start talking about water. Now, that doesn't mean that oxygen 17 isn't there, but as you'll see in the next slide, it's not very abundant. All right? So for most of our work on water, we ignore O17. All right? 
But you'll see that there's a lot of people out there that are really excited by O17. It's in very low abundance, but it's actually there's some new data that's coming out. Um, beginning next week, Naomi Levin will actually talk a lot about O17 and what she calls CAP Delta. Um, and she'll talk a little bit about how you use CAP17 to address some questions that can't be addressed hardly any other way. Well, for our purposes, mostly O16 and O18 are the isotopes that are most abundant in oxygen isotopes. And as you can see, that's in this table here. So here shows the actual abundances of the two stable isotopes, protium and deuterium. 99.98% of all the water out there is H1. All right, pretty simple. Not sometimes that easy to measure, although we're getting, we've gotten better at it over the last 20 years. But then we also have one radioactive isotope, tritium. Uh, those of you that are interested in groundwater or actually hydrologic studies may know that tritium is a very important tracer. Um, it has a half-life of about 12.53 years, and it's really good for dating the age of waters. All right, so if you're interested in trying to get a date, um, tritium can actually be a really important isotope. We're not going to talk about it in this class. And then of the eight stable isotopes of oxygen, Again, we're going to focus mostly on O16 and O18. You can see O17 is, is not very abundant, but it's out there. We can measure it. We regularly measure it. It creates a interference for some of our uh, analyses that we actually have to correct for. Um, and Naomi's going to look uh, in real detail um, at O17, but we're not going to look much at it here. Um, oh, just, to, just know that many times as we're walking through this lecture, and as you read the literature, sometimes the uh, deuterium can be expressed either as 2H or as big D. So just know that people use those interchangeably. You've probably already come to terms with that. But know that sometimes the literature, there's a bias in the geochemical literature to call it 2H. In, in the hydrologic literature, many times they just express it as D. And so, but it's the, we're talking about the same thing. They just give it a, des a different designator. OK, now. When we finally get to water and we join hydrogen and oxygen together into the molecule, um, there's really three of the isotopologues of water that we're most interested in. There's kind of nine different isotopologues or configurations of H and O that we can express out there, including the ones with O17. Um, but these three are the ones that we're measuring. In most of our isotope analysis, we're measuring H216O, h 2 and hd 16 There's the masses over here. I've written them down on the board. And so largely, most of our analyses are focused just in on three, those three isotopologues of water because they're the most abundant. They're the ones that are changing the most in the hydrologic system. They're, what, they're the ones we can track. We can assign fractionation factors to. It's not that these other isotopologues are, are you know, not known about, but we're, they're in such low abundance, and many times they're really, really difficult to measure, that we largely ignore them for most of our hydrologic work. But they're out there. You, they have been measured, and they have been characterized. All right? Um, OK. Isotope expressions, just one more time, just to remind us what our delta notation is. Remember that we're, we're working in per mil notation, or small delta notation. Um, as, and, and the reason why, as Turi reminded us yesterday, is that ratios are a lot easier to measure than absolute concentrations. So we use this in our, in our, to our advantage. And basically, whatever the isotope ratio of our sample is, whether that's expressed as hydrogen or oxygen, is really the ratio of the rare to common or heavy to light isotope within your sample relative to an accepted standard, right? And then we might multiply that by 1,000 to put it into convenient notation, per mil notation, not percent. We do not ever want to see you guys put a percent sign on your data. Rejected, right? <laughs> we'll send it right back to you. We're talking about parts per 1,000, not parts per 100, all right? So make sure you remember to put this down correctly. And then, of course, when it, with respect to our standards, as Terry pointed out yesterday, by convention, we set whatever our standard is to zero per mil, and we compare everything to that benchmark. So this is why it's a delta notation. It's a difference expression. You're looking at how your sample differs from the international standard. And that's why we all have to agree on the standard. 
Otherwise, we're not talking the same language if we don't have the same benchmark to which everybody's sample goes back to and is compared. So this is the beauty of delta notation. We can all work in different parts of the world, in different types of water, plants, animals, soils, groundwater, doesn't matter. As long as we agree on the standard, we're going to be talking the same language. All right? And so for water, that standard, as Turi mentioned, is maintained by general, the IAEA, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. There are isotope police on the planet. All right. They are also the keepers of our international standards. And the standard for both hydrogen and oxygen is VSMO. It's mixed up by uh, the folks in Vienna. If you get a chance to go to IAEA in, v in Vienna, stop by and visit them. It is kind of a weird place to go. There's like 19 layers of security. They think you're a criminal immediately when you show up. Um, and largely because they, they keep some pretty com uh, confidential data. Right? They are, like I said, the isotope police. They know very well who is exploding nuclear bombs out there. And you know, it continues. Right? Make no mistake about it. And so they know because they're measuring all the isotopes all the time. And so this is a very, they have lots of very top secret data at IAEA. But they also mix up these standards. They're really expensive. All right? We get to buy them once every three years from IAEA. Uh, is it now $450? Yeah. yeah. I think $450 for this much water. Is that right, Shivanka? Yeah. And uh, so don't drink the SMO. <laughs> right? It's not a shot glass of water here. So we use that, of course, to calibrate our internal working standards. Every isotope lab does that. So you guys will see there's a Utah's uh, water that you're going to use in the lab. That, that Utah standard is calibrated back to SMO. And then so it's really just a calibration standard, but it's not your everyday working standard. But we have to buy it. We have to calibrate our machines and all of our working standards back to it, just as every lab does. So everybody has SMO in their lab. Um, there's a couple other standards that you may have heard about. If you haven't, we'll talk about them right now. Um, if you work on ice cores or you work on reconstructing uh, paleo temperatures, many times you're working in very cold environments. All right, and many times you'll be expressing your isotope data instead of relative to SMO, relative to these two standards that I've highlighted here in these boxes, one called SLAP, all right, standard light Antarctic precipitation, or GISP, all right, Greenland ice, lap, uh, ice cap precipitation. So if you work with ice cores, realize that there's actually three water standards, SMO, SLAP, and GISP. Read the literature carefully. Many of you may want to go back to some of the literature that was actually worked on, on ice cores, and you'll look at those data, and you'll look at your data, and you go, hmm, I'm confused. And the reason why is because most of those papers with ice cores are not using the same standard you use to look at your liquid water. So read the method section carefully of the paper. If you pick up an ice core paper, they often will be using it. If you're looking at paleo literature, many times they may use one of these standards because it's best calibrated and worked on against an ice core. And you may be working on, say, marine foraminifera, and maybe the oxygen isotopes in those foraminifera. But the reference point is back to an ice core. All right? And so you better go make sure that you understand what the, what the standard was that they compared their isotope data mm -hmm. to. There is. Yeah, it's very easy to interconvert between them. And most of the time, if the paper is worth its salt, it's done it for you. It said, we use GISP, and we converted it to SMO. And they give you those. I've, I think I've given you them in the handout, which I failed to say. And you probably figured this out already. There's two parts of the handout. One is the slides, and one's a bunch of text that's coming out of my mouth that I can't put on the slides and don't want to. But it's in there for reference. All right. Other questions? OK.